Okay, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I'd like to offer you a warm welcome to you all. It's good to see you here tonight. We will begin with uh, singing and scripture reading. The singing tonight is taken from Psalm 97, Psalm 97, verses 3 and 4. And if there's anyone here who's not familiar with the Book of Praise, it's on page 238 of the Book of Praise in the, in the pew with you there. So it's Psalm 97, uh, 3 and 4. begin with scripture reading tonight uh, taken from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, the first six verses. Exodus 3, beginning at verse 1, it's on page 59 in the Pew Bible. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, Moses called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. We'll stop there. Shall we pray together? the beginning. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come to you at the beginning of these lecture series this year to thank you that we can once again resume these talks, these speeches, these lectures after a period of several years when we could not do it for various reasons. Lord, we're thankful that we can be gathered together to study and learn from your word about who you are, what you've done in history, and what you're still doing today. We thank you for Reverend Bauman, who is willing to teach us in these things. We pray that you would grant him strength for this task. We pray for insight and encouragement 
through his teaching also. We also pray for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit so that this event and the series of lectures can bear blessed fruit in the lives and the witness of your people here in Southern Ontario. Will you hear us in Jesus' name? Amen. Once again, I'd like to give a warm welcome to each one of you to the first of this new lecture series this year that we have entitled, Who is God and Why It Matters? A topic of profound importance for us as we consider our identity as Christians and how that impacts our life in this world. Our so-called post-confession lectures were begun several years ago, possibly around 10, I'm not sure the exact number, after hiatus, of course, the last three years. And they have covered many theological, social, and ethical topics. And although they've been called post-confession lectures, meaning talks for folks who've already professed their faith in the church, the reality is that they're meant for everyone, old and young alike. In other words, for anyone who wishes to know the biblical faith or to deepen their faith by learning from thoughtful speakers and from discussion. Our next evening after tonight will be in two weeks on October the 12th, also in this location. And the one following that, our third one, is scheduled for a month later in November, November the 9th, so keep tuned in your bulletins for those. We pray that the Lord will bless these endeavors to keep equip his people. Our speaker tonight is Reverend Bauman. Most of you are familiar with him. He retired just a little over a year ago in Smithville after having served there for a number of years. His ministry, however, began in 1982, and he served several churches in Australia and in Western Canada and also in Ontario. He will be referencing the Belgic Confession in these talks as we go through them. And uh, the Belgic Confession, again, if you're not familiar with the Book of Praise, you'll find that at the back on page 499. We will also have a question and answer session after the speech, if there's enough time. But I promise you, this place is closing down at 9.30. So no matter what's going on, we're shut her down at 9.30. However, Reverend Bauman does prefer text message questions in the question period. So if you have a question, or you're thinking about something to comment to him, um, his preference is that you would send it to on his phone. The phone number, I believe, is up there. Yes, it is. It's 289 Four four zero one four eight nine two eight nine four four zero fourteen eighty nine. So please feel free to take advantage of that. And after nine thirty, the coffee will also be on. So please feel free to stick around for some socialization. So, Reverend Bauman, the floor is yours. You can take it away. So, good evening to you all, and um, how to start on an evening like this, I'm not sure. Um, the idea of a post-confession class, uh, doing it again, was appealing to me, um, simply because retirement gives opportunity and um, things to do is always good, so here's a challenge. A uh, post-confession class, and the topic that I settled on is who is God and why it matters. And then the first question that arises is, why bother with a topic like this? Don't we know the answer? Who is God and why does it matter? We are talking about God. When I started in seminary, um, studying in Hamilton for the ministry, my lecturer or professor in dogmatics was Dr. Faber. Many of you will recall him that as he introduced the topic of the doctrine of God, he paused and said, we're standing on holy ground here. We're all familiar with God. After all, we're Christian. 
but now to devote particular attention to God and speak of God. He said to us students, never you forget your unholy ground. And of course, that's a reference to what the Lord said to Moses at Exodus, at the, the burning bush, Exodus 3. And Moses was told to take his shoes off. And somewhere, perhaps metaphorically, we do well to do the same. We're talking about God. We, finite sinners, are talking of God, the holy, eternal creator, sustainer of heaven and earth. But if that's the case, it's necessary to say up front, none of us will ever grasp God. Human words, human thought, is never big enough to catch the godness of God. Should we even start then? The Lord has revealed himself deliberately to creatures, to people whom he created with finite thought. If he revealed himself to us, the almighty, the infinite, the eternal, revealed himself to the finite, human, sinners at that, we'd be remiss to decide, nah, this topic's too hard. Whilst we never get our heads fully around God, we certainly can grow in our understanding of who He is and what His identity means for people, us. So there's one reason to grasp, grapple with the subject. But a second dovetails or flows from this, and that is we're living in today's world. And today's world, well, it infects all of us. Each one of us is touched by what our world thinks about God, understands God to be. And perhaps we're affected by the world's thinking in a bigger way than we realize. In fact, I think that's a truism. And so there's room in my judgment for some growth in this area, spending some time on the doctrine of God. What I'd like to do tonight, the first lecture, the modern West and the identity of God. What I mean by the phrase, the modern West, is, if you wish, Western civilization. It's North America, it's Europe, it's Australia, it's what's commonly called the West. Though there is distinctly variations between North American West and European West, as in they are different civilizations, there is so much akin in those two that for all practical intents and purposes we can lump it together. Even so, I do intend to zero in specifically on the North American context 
of which we all are a part. There is a um, book came out some while back. Um, very bottom line there, Geisler and House wrote a book called The Battle for God. Whilst that term, title, may sound rather alarming, I do think there is a lot of truth caught in those words. Across North America, the last number of years, there absolutely is a battle for God. And what they mean, and what I mean, revolves on the question of who God is. There are multiple understandings current in North America today on who God is. I listed seven up there, and I want to work our way through what the modern West thinks in relation to God. The first item mentioned there is theism. Theism, the particular word, is simply the word in Greek for God, theos. And what's caught in the concept of theism is the old-fashioned, classical, Christian understanding of God as the almighty, eternal creator of heaven and earth who upholds heaven and earth today, were he to withdraw his upholding hand, this world would collapse into nothingness again. Theism understands God as big and all creation dependent on him. This is the classical position of Christian thinking and it's what's caught in Article 1 of the Belgic Confession. We all believe with the heart and confess with the mouth that there is only one God who is a simple and spiritual being. He is eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, immutable, infinite, almighty, perfectly wise, just, good, and the overflowing fountain of all good. That's theism. Characteristic of historic Christianity, as well, I might add, of Judaism. And in many ways, though perhaps not every attribute, Islam as well thinks of Allah as big, almighty, this world dependent on him. So that's the first. The second is deism. Deism catches the notion that, yes, God made this world. He's that almighty. But then he stepped away from his world and retired back into heaven. And so this world runs on its own. The classic comparison here is to a clockmaker. He's spent his time in the shop making his clock. He's got it going, he winds it up, and he goes home, and the clock keeps on going. Deism. God, arm's length from his creation.
I'm going to suggest that deism is the de facto, um, or catches the de facto thinking of many uh, North American evangelical Christians. Perhaps in our own midst too. The idea that God's definitely there, but for practical intents and purposes, He's over there, and we get to do life here. Not so long ago, there was a study done in relation to what was the thinking of North America's teenagers, 20s, in relation to who is God. And that particular study indeed found that the younger generation was functionally deistic. With a couple of additions, God's there for me when I need him. And he wants me to be nice to everybody. And all nice people go to heaven. And he wants me to be happy. Moral, therapeutic deism. That, in fact, catches, according to this study, the thinking of the younger in North America. That study was done touching 20 years ago now. And it seems to me that we're seeing this moral, therapeutic deism. It's still with us. And it's not only the teenagers. God's there when I need him. God wants me to be nice. And everybody else to be nice to me. And God wants me happy. The third is pantheism. Pantheism, the word itself comes from two Greek words. You see in the middle the same word as the first one, theos, God. And the first three words, P-A-N, pan, is the Greek word for all. Then the point is that all is God. Nature is divine. God is everywhere. This is actually the classic position of Hinduism. And it's the thinking that entered into America in force in the 1960s, 1970s. And again, the older amongst us will remember the, um, so many of the songs that were generated at the time, but they communicated this notion of pantheism, God, all things are God, are divine, are in so. The fourth one, actually on the, on the third one yet, I should say, it, it also dovetails greatly today with green theology, since everything is divine, treat everything as divine. The fourth one is panentheism. And you notice it's the same word as number three with the addition of two letters, E-N. And there's the notion that God is in everything. 
Not that everything is divine, but the divine God is in everything in the same way we're told as the soul is in the body. Okay. But characteristic of this panentheism, it's taking parts of number two, deism, and parts of number three, pantheism, and blending it together, and then coming up with a very characteristically 21st century concept that is a kind of a new ideology, if you will. And that's the notion that God himself changes. Just as a soul, spirit, matures, grows as the body does, so God changes, grows, matures, as this world does. The whole notion of change is very much in the air in our current time period. Evolution says we keep on growing, developing. Politics wants us to keep on growing, changing. Change is the buzzword. We can do better. Well, says this panentheism, God's changing, God's growing. For the theologically literate, I'm talking about process theology. God's growing, but he doesn't grow apart from the body, this world, as a soul doesn't grow apart from a body, but this development in God is deeply connected to how people function. And so you get this idea that while God is God, he doesn't know exactly all that's going to happen because people make decisions and God is going to have to adjust his own plans and his own thinking dependent on what people think and what people do. And so we end up with an interactive relationship where God adjusts himself there's your change, there's your growth, depending on people's thoughts, people's actions. The fifth one, finite Godism, is the notion that God is small finite. So God may have created this world, but he's bought himself a job bigger than he can handle. Perhaps you recall the book by um, Harold Kushner, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, published in 1981. But Harold Kushner is perhaps the, the best known proponent of God is small, God is finite, when he says God would love to stop bad things happening. But he can't. He's just not big enough to stop the bad. And if you're going to counter with that, 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 that all things are in his hand, then Kushner's going to say, well, if you're going to say that God's strong enough to stop the bad, then you're going to have to admit that God's love is small. 
I mean, why else would he let bad things happen to good people? So either way, there's a smallness, there's a finiteness to God. And you'll be aware that this particular theology, understanding of God, has, has been embraced in, in our culture. God is small. The sixth is polytheism. The word poly comes from the Greek word for many. So, many gods. We are familiar with this notion from the Old Testament, the New Testament. Egypt had many gods. Canaan had many gods. Um, yeah, so did the Romans, so did the Greeks, right? Um, and these gods were all in contention with each other and so on. That kind of a thought, multiple gods, many gods, though not too popular, nevertheless is there in Mormonism, witchcraft. A variation, perhaps, of this polytheism is better known, and that is pluralism, where all gods, religions, are thought to be multiple avenues to the one central being, pluralism. And the last is atheism. The word a catches the Greek notion of negative. So, God, there are no gods. Gods are figments of the imagination. This is the classical position of Marxism. There is no God. Saying there is, teaching religion, is simply a way to oppress the masses so that the masses will work for the elite. Religion is the opium of the people, right? Marx would say. This actually, there's this, there's this atheism, is the position of secular humanism and today's radical left. So then you've got seven understandings of God, if you will that are current in North America. The list is not complete, but I've certainly picked up, as far as I know, the, the dominant perceptions. But it leads to the next question, and that is, where would you position yourself on that list? As Reformed Christians, where are we? And then, of course, we're going to say, well, we're, 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 we're with number one. Uh, the first bullet point, we're theists. I mean, we did just look at the Belgic Confession, Article 1. That's our official papers. I mean, this is us. Yeah. I suspect that in reality we are more a blend of two and four than we are of one. That sense that God is here for us 
that God wants us happy. That was number two, right? Particularly this moral therapeutic deism. Plus, here's number four comes in. It seems to me that in our midst too, conservative, reformed Christians, we think in terms of there's development in God, particularly in as much as the Lord moves the goalposts. And by that last little bit, what I mean is that what was okay 100 years ago is not okay today. Goalposts have shifted. Flip that around. What's okay today? Our fathers wouldn't have considered okay in 100 years, right? But somewhere the thought Goalposts shift. This panentheism, that was his number four, says that God is in us. But if God is in us, then, then is his revelation or is our understanding of what God wants limited to referring to the Bible? And what you hear in our midst is things like, God wants me to, I just know God wants me to, and you fill in the blank. But that sense of, I get to decide what God wants of me. And in practical terms, time and time again, what it is that God wants of me ends up being what I think makes me happy. See, and there's where I say there's this blend of number two and number four. Now, let me try to, to color that in a bit. I'd mentioned already the moral therapeutic deism where the word therapeutic catches the notion of being happy. We hear in the word thera therapeutic, the word therapy, and understand it's got to do with feelings. It's got to do with healing of hurt feelings. It's got to do with being happy. Make me happy. Today, today's thinking tells us that the real me is a psychological me. The feelings me. In the sense, perhaps, even that there's something divine authoritative in the feelings. And today being today and heirs as we are to Sigmund Freud, the inner feelings, what makes me really happy is primarily sexually driven. <coughs> And you decide what makes you happy. Sex does. That's being preached left, right, and center. 
But that in turn, I'm not comfortable in me. I feel like I'm a male in a woman's body or whatever, right? You get this whole matter of gender fluidity. If I'm defining who I am because I'm listening to that inner voice, that bit of divine inside that wants me happy. And God won't criticize you. God won't. For God wants you happy. He himself changes with time. So you get to change along with him. He moves goalposts. Now it's okay to change your gender. 20 years ago, you wouldn't have thought of it. Goalposts change. Now, that's one example. Maybe it's too contemporary. Another example relates, for example, to the matter of divorce, remarriage. God wants you happy. You're stuck in a bad marriage. At least you're not happy in that marriage. 30 years ago, divorce wasn't an option, really. Not really. Not in our midst, not as Christians. But goalposts have changed. Because God changes, doesn't he? It's panentheism. And he wants you happy. Part of deism. And so we say, well, if that's what God wants, and these are the openings God gives, then, well, this is what I grab. This is the air that we breathe. And it affects our thinking. If, in fact, it's true, God wants me happy, and I don't feel so happy, and I should listen to my inner voice, and God doesn't mind change, is it any surprise that we're going to end up with a measure of confusion as to what's right and what's wrong? And even anxiety? If goalposts change, if my feelings are somehow authoritative, but my feelings change from day to day, then you end up with, but what is right? What is wrong? Am I doing the right thing? Anxiety. And it does lead to pastoral trouble, counseling. There's a lot more of counseling, also in our own midst, than used to be the case. I think there's another consequence of all of this, and just look at the, the feel of worship services. There we go. Eh? The feel of worship services. We're meant to feel happy. The worship service is meant to be uplifting. And of course, there's truth in that. But at the end of the day, if you're going to insist that church is a place to be happy, 
You're going to get a different emphasis in the preaching, a different emphasis in the singing in order to accommodate your wishes. And it seems to me we've seen some of that happening. Anyway. So what to do about it? How do we, how do we counter these developments? This, 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 what I see as us being more caught in a blend of number two, deism, and number four, panentheism, than we wish to perhaps concede. Well, I'm reminded of um, a statement that Martin Luther made to, in relation to um, Erasmus. At a given moment, Martin Luther said of Erasmus, your God is too small. Of the seven positions I've listed here, Erasmus would find himself most comfortable with number two, deism. God made this world at arm's length, and you get to do your thing, and you get to make your decisions. And in that sense, he'd also have some room for number four, God works with what you desire. Arminius did the same, Pelagius the same, God's the perfect gentleman. He knocks on your door and offers you the gospel and he waits for you to open the door. Uh, God won't force anything. It's dependent on you. The choice is yours. Those small thoughts of God. Back in... 1973, James Packer published a book called um, Knowing God. About a decade later, R.C. Spruill published The Holiness of God. Those two books had a profound impact amongst North American evangelical thinkers. In as much as both Packer and Spruill insisted on what I would call the godness of God. And they strove to return North American thinking to position one, theism. They did that in the context of Billy Graham, a man that God has definitely used to advance his kingdom, but Billy Graham had smaller thoughts of God than was healthy. And that last smaller thoughts of God than was healthy is a reference to his latent Arminianism. The same thoughts of Erasmus. God waits for you to decide. To which Packer and Spool responded, if God is that kind, if God is that gentle, if God is that patient, then why should I bother serving this God because he's not big enough to help me anyway? Besides, it's too kind to send me to hell. So I'll be fine in the long run. God loves you. And Packer and Spruill says, have big thoughts of God. Understand how dependent you are on the Almighty. By the grace of the Lord, the work begun by people as Packer and Spruill has had a profound effect across North America in the rise of what's today called neo 
Calvinism. Neo-Calvinism is associated with names as John Piper, Alistair Begg, John MacArthur, Tim Keller, the list goes on. Ligonier Ministries has had a, well, of course, that's, that's, that, is, that is Spruill, but has had a profound impact in seeking to restore evangelical thinking to position one. I'm thankful for that, deeply thankful. And it seems to me that what we're needing to do is take this material that by the grace of God has come into North America through men as these, and make it more our own. And that is what I intend to do in the coming evenings to pick up on what's in Article 1 and draw out what's meant by the various terms that are used here. God is simple. What's that mean? Spiritual. What's that mean? Eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, immutable, etc. What does that mean and how does that in fact touch you in your daily walk with God in Canada of 2022? So that's my intent going forward, and I understand the reasons why. And to whet your appetite a little bit as to what I intend to do next time, what's missing in that list? I'm seeing a few mouths saying holy, and I would absolutely agree. But I'm also thinking, we're North Americans of 2022. What makes the world go round? Yeah, money. <laughs> and we say love. And love's not there. Nor any biblical word connected to love like kindness or mercy or grace. And so what I want to do next time is explore that. But that's for next time. That was just to whet your appetite. So there's what I wanted to say tonight. We do have time for Q&A. We got lots of time for Q&A, and that's fine. Like I, um, yeah, the number's up there. Um, much as I love conversation um, in a room like this, I'm just not going to hear what gets said. So I fire away, text me, and I'll see what I can do.
What did he say? I have no idea. Oh, what if the reception is so bad it won't say? I'll tell you what, on Sunday night we had a uh, kickoff meeting and Reverend Bauman was our speaker too. It was in the book of Revelation. And uh, people did kind of slowly on start sending in the questions. Yeah. I think there were quite a few in the long run. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Update your technology. Go for Rogers. Is your phone not working inside the church building? Then speak up and I will try to repeat it if you, if you have to. But this microphone doesn't move around. Our sound technician is getting a portable uh, microphone there. How would Gnosticism fall into that list? I meet many who describe themselves in such manner, claiming they don't believe in God, but they also don't believe there's enough evidence to say there isn't one. Where would you place them? I think in all practical terms, they're amongst the atheists. They're not taking God seriously. Flip side, um, it's so much going to depend on what you mean by Gnosticism. Um, the definition that you've got there catches the notion of, um, I can't be sure. Um, but there's also, of course, that strong strand of Gnosticism um, that goes back to days of, of the Apostle John. Um, and that's a bit of a different thing. That's, that's a Greek philosophy. Um, but yeah, these Gnostics of today, in that sense that you're, um, they're functionally saying, look, we just don't know. So... Practically, atheists. Oh, your question came through now. What exactly is deficient in moral therapeutic deism? With a couple of options, lordship, providence. What is deficient in moral therapeutic deism is each of the three words. Deism, God's at arm's length. All right? The clockmaker's gone home, and you're the clock ticking away. Therapeutic catches the notion of God wants you to be happy. And of course, there's truth in that. I mean, the Lord created us for paradise, and the Lord's redeeming us a paradise restored. In between is the redeeming work of the Savior. So Jesus says, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, they will inherit this earth, and so on. Blessed. But the word translated as blessed is literally the Greek word for happy. Does God want us to be happy? Yes. But the thing is, in moral therapeutic deism, where God's at arm's length, you get to describe what makes you happy. God wants you happy, so now you get to, well, this makes me happy, Lord, so can you supply this? Or this makes me happy, so I'm okay to do this, no? And the word moral, what's, what's caught in that word moral there is the notion of Everybody's expected to be nice to everybody. Is that true? Well, yeah. Um, But when I do what's wrong, you're meant to come and admonish me, whether I like it or not. And in today's world, that's called being not nice. Who are you to judge me?
So what's deficient in moral therapeutic deism? Just to stay with the words, I think that in itself is providence deficient. Well, yeah, if God's at arm's length, the watchmaker's gone home. Um, yeah, that's deficient then too. And so is lordship then. But it's a much bigger thing. Our pastors have a difficulty preaching theistic theology. Or are people just not willing to listen and are being too heavily influenced by the world around us? It's an interesting question. Are pastors having difficulty preaching it or are people so influenced by it, not willing to listen. I'm not sure it's an either or. I think it's a both and. <laughs> um, there is absolutely a, an interactive dynamic between the pulpit and the pew. And that's not just when there's somebody standing up front talking to people, but there's also the expectation and you're sitting in the office, as I prepare sermons, in the eye of my mind, I see a congregation in front of me. And as I lay out a thought um, on my computer screen, I'm seeing faces. How are they going to respond to this? And if I know ahead of time, they're not going to respond well. What I'm saying isn't nice then tell you what, the temptation is distinctly there to, to revise what I'm going to say. That's absolutely true. Um, human nature, uh, I don't want to offend anybody. So there's an interactive, so I'm not sure it's an either or. I think it's a, it's a both and. Um, we do want to be nice, and we expect the preacher to be nice to us. Yeah, I think that is true. That is, that is North America of 2022. That's fact. And what that means in turn, of course, is that um, we've got to be aware of that problem. And as preachers, we need to dare to say what God says. That is where the truth is. The truth is not in that inner voice feelings, be nice, tolerant. And it also means that the congregation yeah, needs to, needs to um, be willing to have their toes trodden upon um, and pray. Pray for the preacher and pray for open hearts to receive the preaching. Anything else? The psychological... Okay, that's the second one came through. The psychological concept of schema is a device to think about anyone's being or who they are, namely their identity being comprised of one immutable characteristic that they were born with, their DNA, their race, genetics, brain size, etc., and two, their lived experiences, their actions, their decisions, and the consequences of them combining to make their identity. Is it possible to think of God through the lens of a schema, that is, to think of who he is through both his eternal infinite characteristics on the one hand and his actions and works on the other, combining, I suppose, to make him who he is. 
Is his identity comprised of both who he is and what he's done? And should, be, should they be differentiated in understanding God? Or is this a form of panentheism? What's so interesting is that um, you take the passage we read from Exodus 3, and um, the Lord says to Moses, take your shoes off your feet, this is holy ground, but he got Moses' attention through deeds. There's a bush that wasn't burning. And then God moves on to explain who he is. I am who I am. My point in answering this way is that the Lord reveals his identity both through his words and his deeds. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of heaven. And he underlined his preaching with miracles. He illustrated who he was by his deeds. After he'd first spoken them. But how do we get to know God? And as we'll see in the coming weeks, um, it's very much a matter of what God has said and what God has done. You cannot separate the two. The same person has asked about the preachers having difficulty preaching theistic theology or people not willing to listen, writes, I expect preachers to preach truth and make me uncomfortable sometimes. That's how we grow. Indeed. That is the preacher's job. Anything else? So I suppose that means we're going to wrap this up. So one more little comment on my part, and that is that um, I trust you understand that what I've done tonight is background to what I intend to say next with more difficult concepts tonight than will be present next time. Next time we're going to be digging right into the scriptures, into the confessions, and then it's areas that we're comfortable with. And so in that sense, probably not as complex or heady as tonight may have been. Thank you. Yeah, you want me to? You know what? Let's uh, let's sing together. Um, Psalm uh, Psalm eighty nine. Psalm eighty nine. Let's sing together. Stanzas one and three. I'll close the prayer.
Let's give thanks and pray. Our gracious, faithful Father, we do acknowledge there is no God but you, almighty, infinite, our God in Jesus Christ. We also confess, Lord, that we are today's people and we breathe deeply the air that's around us. And then, Lord, we pray that our understanding of you be biblical and our lifestyle follow that. And, Lord, we pray for grace, too, to examine our thinking. Give us grace to be honest about how we see you, whether in practice you are at arm's length from us in our thinking, in our decision making, whether in practice the decisions we made are driven more by our feelings and our wants or sins that makes us happy than by your revelation. Lord, we confess our weaknesses and our sins and thank you that you have given your Son so that sinners may be children of God. Lord, we delight in that and pray for your grace to treasure what you have done in Christ Jesus. Bless us as we go home. Bless us as we think about and talk about this material with our children, with our grandchildren. Bless, Lord, that as churches we grow in you. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake.